All right, welcome uh, all of you who are worshiping online. I'm Chip Fried, the lead teaching pastor here. So good to be together. Uh, I am really excited about the concerts that Bill brought up, both our chancel choir, some of the young adults, Dre and Leah, Fred Wee, three great opportunities for mission. The first two for uh, Afghan refugees. The, the agency is coming to be with us, has care right now of 200 families. And for every $1,500 we raise, we can furnish an entire home. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to be doing that. So uh, it's good to continue in our teaching series except for that scripture man how about that I texted Bill Lacey this morning he's one of our leaders I knew he was going to be reading it and I said are we still friends <laughs> and he texted me back he said is this the Bible or Netflix <laughs> honestly I bet you have never heard a message on this in your life I, I've never heard one and for heaven's sake I have never preached one in over three decades of preaching. And in about 30 minutes, we'll all decide if I ever should have, right? <laughs> this is some juicy stuff. And I'm preaching under there's no place like home, family secrets. I'm gonna tell you, friends, we all we got a few skeletons in our closets. My chaplain my, who brought me to Christ used to say, if there was a great novelist, Bill mentioned Daniel Steele or, a, or a, a great movie writer, if they followed any one of us around in our life, there'd be enough in there to write something, right? And, and I, I'm preaching this message, and, we're, and then Scott and Terry and Steve are going to take out the last two, because um, just for a reality check, too, um, I love the fact that we have a, a team of pastors. I, I was a solo act for so long. To be, to be with five or six pastors, really good preachers in this church, is really, really cool, and we always chop it up. So I want to give a shout-out online to our online pastor, Pastor Kurt, because when we were forming this series, he grounded us. He said something really important. He said, look, if we're not careful, we're going to remember romanticize home. You know, Dorothy, there's no place like home. Our video that shows all those wonderful homecomings. But the truth is, for some people, home is a train wreck. Right? They say home is where the heart is. How about this? Home is sometimes also where the heart ache is. And so the Bible doesn't pull punches about this. Right? And, and it's very clear that sometimes uh, we're in touch with what we call in our mission statement our common brokenness. We try to cover it up, we try to hide it. And you know the number one place that people do that the most? In church. Because we come to church and we dress up and we're the good people, right? And Jesus called the Pharisees that were hiding behind their religious righteousness, he called them a bunch of hypocrites. Now, hypocrite in the Greek and in that day and age had a significant meaning. The word literally meant it was a word from theater when back in that day, you ever see those, they held up the mass, you know, the one on the sticks. And, and that's what we do too many times. Is, and that's why one of our core values at Garfield Memorial is authenticity. Connecting with a real God in a real world. That's why I laugh when somebody yelled at me, year, you know, months ago, said, oh, like all the masks in church. I said, shut up, you've been wearing one for years. You know, we, we put up these things, and, but the Bible doesn't. And this is really helpful to us. This helps us, in my opinion, know how to read the Bible. Too many people talk about the Bible, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's a bunch of fables, or Aesop's fables, or it's, you know, it's a good story. When I came to Garfield, there was a person here that came into my office and said, hey, every Sunday you're preaching. Like, you preach like you believe this stuff. I said, well, yeah. He's like, well, I don't. Oh, really? <laughs> I've been in church how many years? Um, and he said, well, you know, I read the Bible. It's kind of like Shakespeare. Mm. Mahatma Gandhi, if you read my e-note a few weeks ago, crit critiqued Christians. He, he said the gospel of Jesus Christ influenced him so much that he would have become a Christian if he could ever met one. And he said this to Christians. He said, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, turn the world upside down, and bring, bring peace to a battle-torn planet, but you treat it as though it was nothing more than a piece of literature. See, in this story, we find out, somebody once told me, well, they th thought the Bible was a collection of inspirational stories with moral examples to follow. Really? Who's the moral example in this story? Judah? The guy who sleeps with whoever he wants to, treats women like objects, wants to burn them at the stake. You know, Judah, this, this hypocrite, see the moral example for us to follow? 
or maybe it's Tamar. Now we're gonna get into Tamar. Tamar's a victim, there's absolutely no question. We're gonna take a deep dive to figure out what that is. But is it Tamar, really are we to follow prostitution, sexual entrapment, who's the example in the story? The Bible is not a set of inspirational stories with moral examples for you to follow. The moral of the Bible is morals won't save you. You cannot be saved by your moral performance. If you try to do that, you become just like the Pharisees. That was their gospel. You'll be mean, judgmental, and irritating, and nobody will want to be around you. You will grind yourself into the ground. Paul said that, who was a former Pharisee, if you read his letters, and he said he tried to follow every iota and letter of the law, and it was grinding him into the dust until for Jesus. And see, the point of the Bible, the more of the Bible, is not about how we, you know, increase our moral performance. Of course we're trying to walk in righteousness and, and you know, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly before God, all that. But that's not what saves us. The book of the Bible is stories of how God's grace breaks through the human family mess that we create. That's what the Bible is. It's stories about how God's grace breaks through. Now, where do I get that word breakthrough? You heard it at the end of the story when Tamar had the twins. The son Perez, she named, was the one who broke out. His, his brother was coming out and, and put a, a scarlet thread around, but old Perez pulled him back down and said, I'm getting out first. And Tamar said, you're the one who broke out. Breakthrough. And God's grace breaks through the mess that we create whether it's in our families, whether it's in our country, whether it's in our churches, wherever it may be, in our communities, neighborhoods, even within ourselves. He breaks us out, and thanks be to God. So we're going to talk about three breakouts. Two I'm going to really talk about, one that these two point to. First is the breakthrough of Tamar. The second is the breakthrough of Judah. And the last one will be the breakthrough of the ultimate son, the true son, the true and better Perez, the son of the promise. So let's get into Tamar. Tamar is a victim of the common brokenness of the world. She is utterly powerless, she is oppressed, she is marginalized, and she is pushed to the other margins of society, brutally. Tamar, first, is a woman. Women in that day and age, I don't like this, my friends, my sisters, but we need to understand the context, had absolutely no sense of value or purpose. Women could not testify in a court of law. Their testimony was not valid. They could not get a job. They could not learn a trade. When Jesus showed up in the Roman Empire, it was legal in the Greco-Roman world that if you gave birth to an infant daughter, you could literally throw her in the trash heap. So that's the context, and this is even before that time. And, and she is twice over a widow. If we read the first 10 verses, like, look, this story was bad. If I'd have read the whole thing, it got worse. In the first 10 verses, we learn that uh, Tamar was given, she, had, she didn't choose it, to Judah's oldest son, a guy named Ur, E-R. We don't know much about him at all, but the narrator tells us that he was wicked and cruel and he died in the judgment of God. So she was married to this wicked, cruel man. He died. So she was handed off then to Judah's second son, Onan, and he is equally cruel and wicked and dies under the Lord's judgment. And now Tamar is left twice over a widow. Widows were utterly powerless. This is not a free market economy. You could not, as a, wi a widow, go out and get a job. The only sense of, of worth and security and protection that you had was within a marriage and within a family. And not only is this, this Tamar woman a widow, she's a teenager. See, women in that day and age got married. You've heard me preach on this in the Christmas story. But women were married immediately after puberty. So 13, 14, at latest 15 or 16 years old. And so she's been, had this gone through this, and now Jay, the, her so widows were so uh, unable to provide for themselves that the society created what they called leveret law, L-E-V-I-R, comes from the word for brother-in-law. And what happened was, if there was a widow, the provider of that widow legally fell onto the task of the father-in-law. So it was Judah's responsibility by law to take care of Tamar. 
And so if, and per that law, if the father has other sons, those sons are to be given to her as a husband. So that's what happens. Ur dies, he gives Onan, Onan dies. Now, Shema is younger. He's probably, I don't know, 12 or 13. And, and by this time, Tamar may be 16. And he says, well, give him a few years, just a few years, and go back to your father's house. Don't call us, we'll call you. And then when Shema is old enough, I'll give him to you as a wife. Tamar is utterly at the, you know, at the, at the power of Judah and the protection of Judah. And Judah has no intention of giving Shema to her. You've heard it in verse 11, didn't you? I think we have that verse we can throw up there, right? He, said, he says publicly, oh yeah, I'll do my job. I'll follow God. Live as a widow in your father's household until my son grows up. But then watch what he's saying inside. But inside he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. He has no intention of giving Shema to, to Tamar. Tamar is left absolutely a victim oppressed by Judah's own corruption as well as the society's corruption. But in this story, the story actually, scholars would say, Tamar becomes the protagonist. She goes into action. What she does is, is incredible. She is fighting for her freedom. She's not going to take this without a fight. She is fighting for justice. And she's turning the hypocrisy of the society back on itself and fighting back. And, and what this is teaching us, if we look in the story, that as Tamar ultimately breaks through and ends up in the family tree of Jesus, God, it reminds us God is always on the side of the oppressed. Have you ever heard somebody say to you, God doesn't take sides? That's not true. God always takes sides. You think Pharaoh thought God didn't take sides? Right? God is, and God is always on the side of those who are oppressed, marginalized, abused. So we know in family secrets there have been some victims. Wouldn't it be a lot easier if our sins just hurt us? I always felt that way, you know, I wish my sins just affected me, but they affect people around you, right? People you love. So if you have been a victim of something like this, I want you to know God is always on your side. He always takes the side of victims. He is drawn to brokenness, right? He's drawn to our, to our hurt. I love when my son Matthew left, led worship last week when Dre and Lee were out of town. He sang that wonderful song that says, you know, are, are you wounded and broken from, uh, I'm sorry, are, I know I got this. Uh, are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. He's a suffering servant. He's a wounded healer. And Tamar, God works and, and brings her out of the absolute injustice and corruption in her life. And this is always what God does, right? Read, let, me, let me put up there for you a couple scriptures. Look at Psalm 146. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. Isaiah says it this way, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless and the widow's case does not come before them. Therefore, I will turn my hand against them. Jeremiah, God said, I've become a father to the fatherless and a defender and a provider of widows. Whose side are you on? I am not talking about political parties. Three billion years from now in eternity, we won't remember what one of those were. I'm talking about as the Spirit of God is working in the world today. Whose side are you on? We need to be on the side of those who've been marginalized or wounded, always hard stop. And this is what this teaches us. And Tamar in this story, tragically, no one is helping her. Judah's obligated. He doesn't do it. Nobody's else stepping up. And it's a reminder to us of what God feels, that God will turn his hand against us if we see people who are wounded and hurting and marginalized and overlooked, and we do nothing. What did, what did John say? How can the love of God be in anyone who sees their brother and sister and, and has ability but refuses to help? I've tried to teach my kids this. 
I've taught them from, this was, this was like a baseline I wanted so badly to teach them that if you ever feel entitled, if you ever feel privileged, it's so not of God. That whoever is broken or hurting and wounded, you need to be advocate and we, we all need to be one and you're sometimes gonna be the one broken and wounding and need somebody. And I was writing that in my notes and I remembered one of the proudest moments I ever had to be a dad. I probably told this story three times in 17 years, so if you heard it before, just bear with me. But it happened with my middle son, Perry. Perry went to Orange High School down the street. He was a really, really good athlete. He was, you know, kind of the, you know, their star athlete down there, four-year starter in golf, four-year starter in basketball, captain of both teams, all conference, all state, all these things. Pretty, pretty well known. And uh, one day, I think his car was in the shop. I was dropping Perry off. I think it was his junior year. And I had to drop him off at school. I said, hey, hey, bud, I'll come back and pick you up after. It was after basketball season. So I, I said, I'll, I'll be back early. He said, no, don't come early, dad. He said, I, I got to stay. I said, for what? He said, I got a couple detentions. It was a good thing I had to get to a meeting because, you know, I was like, okay, what'd you get the detentions for? Like, well, I was late to some classes. Okay, we'll talk about this later. Dropped him off, uh, came back to the church, had some meetings. About one o'clock, a little after lunch, I got a call on, here at the office on my cell phone, and it was the principal of Orange High School. His name was Dan. He's not the current principal. I like Dan a lot. We, we, were, we were brothers under the skin because Dan didn't start in the suburbs. He came from the city. If you do that, I trust you. <laughs> like, you know. And so Dan and I, we were kind of straightforward, straight shooters. And Dan calls me and says, hey, Chip, he said, I need to talk to you about Perry. Uh-oh. <laughs> the same morning, the detentions. I'm like, okay. He said, well, hey, let me ask you something. I was coaching varsity basketball at the time. I did that for about eight years up here. And, and I knew a lot of the kids, not just on the team, but I was very involved in the student body. And he mentioned me a student's name. He said, hey, do you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah, yeah, I know him. I usually see him outside in the halls and we're always, we greet each other and that. He said, yeah. He said, did you know that uh, a couple weeks ago he came out very publicly in the school with teachers and the student body everybody to announce that he was gay? And I said, yeah, I actually know that. I mean, he told me that in a conversation. He said, well, let me tell you something you don't know. He said, we got room through the grapevine. He said, you know, we got some entitled kids up here. And after he made that announcement, we heard that there were some kids that were gonna jump him in a hallway where we don't have a hall monitor and beat him up. He says, I called that young man into my office this afternoon. And I said, hey, this is a rumor we heard, is this true? And the young man said, well, it was true last week. He said, yeah, there were some guys, they wanted to do some bad things. But he said, but Perry Freed took care of that. And he said, what do you mean Perry Freed took care of that? He said, well, there was a word out there that somebody was gonna do that and uh, Perry got up in the lunchroom and he announced if anybody laid a hand on me, they'd have to go through him. So he said, last week, Perry walked with me every day of, the, of class down that hallway to make sure nothing bad happened. And Dan said, that, did you know your son got detentions for being late to class because he was walking his friend down the hall? And he said, Chip, knowing the kind of guy you are, I just thought maybe you'd like to know that. And that was the proudest day that I ever had of being a dad. Friends, God takes sides. And when people are marginalized and oppressed and cast out, God is on their side. Where are you? Where am I? That's the breakthrough that all of us need to have and we'll experience it in the work of what Jesus does of healing hurting hearts in this world. Okay, let's go to Judah. You can probably relate with Judah, most of you better than Tamar. Who is Judah? Judah is, man, Judah is, he's got a great pedigree, man. He's the great grandson of Abraham. You can't be a better religious person than Judah. I mean, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and now Judah, nobody in the history of the world at that time had the knowledge or the awareness of God that Judah had, right? So why is he behaving like this? Because Judah is lacking something. Judah is lacking an awareness of his own brokenness. He has no sense, he's reveling in his pride of being the great grandson of Abraham, the family tree belonging to the greatest church, knowing God personally, and behind it he's an absolute, uh, you know, shrill of a man. I mean, we see him, he's in denial. 
He's blaming everything on Tamar. He's not giving, no, I'm blaming Shema. I'm not giving my son to have a Shema. She'll die. He is totally denying that both of his sons were wicked and cruel and evil. And he probably had a role in that of failure as a father. And he's absolutely uh, just a total lack of self-awareness. And when he gets into this mess with, with Tamar, not knowing that it's his daughter-in-law, because he can have sex with whoever he wants to have sex with whenever he wants to have it. But here, her, she needs to live as a celibate widow in the day she decides to do it herself, burn her. Do you see the hypocrisy in this society? And, and, and Judah's contributing to that. And what he does is when he finds out that Tamar has played the role of, you know, prostitute and gotten pregnant, he says, take her out and burn her. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's only two words, take, burn. This is excessive. I know, I know the ways of primitive societies, you know, the Old Testament, sometimes we cringe at these death penalties and stowings and that. But even, even in that primitive society, this is over the top. Readers would have known this is, this is extremely hateful. They did not execute people by fire. Fire was torturous death. What's going on with, with Judah that he's, that he's this murderous, hateful person in his heart because he's been blaming Tamar for so long to, to not have to face his own sins? And I'm going to tell you, friends, we do that so much in society. It's those people's fault. It's these ones over here. If they didn't do what they do, and we don't take the time to look in and see our own sins and see in our own brokenness and understand that the people we despise the most, that we're absolutely no better than. And Judah doesn't have that awareness. And so he's been living this lie and living this denial and it breaks out in rageful ways. We've seen this in our society. You start believing lies too long and, and you know, all these other things and, and it's everybody's fault and pointing fingers and that stuff can come out of you and turn into something really twisted. And, and not only is Tamar going into the fire pit, Judah's going into the fire pit. And Tamar actually what she does is wake him up. Because see, we live with what I call self-justification instead of self-examination. We are always justifying ourselves. We're always making excuses. If you can put this one on hold whenever something comes in and you're feeling defensive and do some inner examination, do like what the end of Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. So I'm gonna teach you a Hebrew word, okay? You ready for it? It's a great word, it's a word, hakarna. Hakarna, I'm gonna make the contention in the Bible, is about spiritual awakening. And it appears in this Genesis story at key moments. And here's the first of them, Judah, in self-denial. Judah, not looking at himself and seeing uh, how wretched he is becoming, right? In fact, Right. Tamar sends him his wallet back. That's basically what it was. What should I leave before I bring the goat? He left his signet. That would have been like his credit card and his photo ID. And she sends it back to him and she says, hey, do you hawk or not <laughs> these things? And she's trying to wake him up. Do you see how you, you've become? Do you see how broken you are? Do you see how bad you're falling? And it worked. Because it said, if you read it, Judah said, I do recognize, I do hawk or not. And what did he say? She is more righteous than me. He, he, he had some spiritual smelling salts begin to work in his life. And this is what I've learned, friends. God's grace comes in to all of us in the family messes, the human crisis we create, and all of us would be goners without it. And it comes into us just as we're about to sink. But here's something I want you to remember. Grace, no one ever receives God's grace until we realize how desperately we need it. If we don't hawk or not, and this is on all sides and all people and all places, if we don't recognize our own sin, our own brokenness, you will not be equipped or able to receive God's grace. Your own self-righteousness will be a force field that will not let it come in and do the work it needs to do in your life. And Judah is woken up, right? He, he's woken up. And he's starting to realize that he has been descending into this this kind of hateful person for a while. See, spiritual awakening, you have to go through some painful stuff usually to be awakened. It usually doesn't happen when everything's going great in your life and all your bills are paid and, you know, your child never has detention, you know, all those things. That usually doesn't happen. You usually have to go through some things. 
God has to let some things happen to wake us up, right? And I noticed if you go back to the beginning of Genesis 38, how this whole story started, we didn't read it, but it says this. At that time, right, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Ajalon. And if you, we keep reading, he married a woman, he took Tamar for his son Ur, he settled down, he built a home and raised his family. But at this time, at what time? If you back up a chapter in Genesis 37, there's a story where Judah and his brothers are out in the field. They are all sons of Leah, and they hated the two sons of Rachel because that was another family mess. If you read your Bible, Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah, and he abused Leah and only used her to get to Rachel. I love how people tell me that oh, the Bible, you know, talks about the purity of marriage. Where? I'm still looking. Polygamy? Spousal abuse? And that mess of this rivalry, two women, right? The, 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 the mess of the man abusing them creates this enmity with their kids, family curses, generational curses. And now here comes Joseph, you know the story, out into the fields with his wonderful coat of being his father's beloved person. And Judah comes up with the idea, let's get rid of him. Let's kill him right here, we got him. And you remember they take him, they stuff him down a hole. And then they eventually sell him into slavery in Egypt. You know the story, some of you? If you don't, it's a great story. Read it. And then they go back. They put some goat of a blood on Joseph's coat of many colors. And they take it back to Jacob, the father. And what do they say to him? Do you hakanah this? See how that word just keeps peering up? And Joseph falls apart. Yes, it's a, or Jacob. He's, yes, it's a, a wild animal must have killed my son, Joseph. And what happens? He is falling into this mess. Jacob, and at this time, after doing that, is it any wonder that chapter 38 is as juicy as it is? Do you see how this stuff spirals and takes us down into the darkness? But what happens is when he has had this hakanah, and we all need a Tamar to come into our lives sometimes and say, hey, are you recognizing? Because we all got blind spots. If you don't think you have a blind spot, that's your blind spot, right? I mean, the sin that's doing the most damage in your life right now is by definition the one you don't see. So this is why small groups and other things are so important. We need Tamars in our lives, right, to, to call us into that. But what happens is after he has his hawker, no, after he has his awakening and he realizes, yeah, I do recognize, I am a broken, broken man. And without Tamar, I would be lost. She has woken me up. And you say, well, how do you know that, Chip? Go on in the story. If you go on in the story, he ends up, he and his brothers, down in Egypt. Like I said, I'll, I'll try to narrate it for those who've never read it. Joseph, who has been sent to slavery in Egypt, he rises up to become the prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. There's a famine in the land. Jacob sends his sons down to Egypt to get bread. They go down the land, and Judah and his brothers, who had done this terrible deed, are now in front of Joseph, and they do not know who he is. They assume he's a prime minister of Egypt and they're seeking bread and Joseph doesn't know if these hard-hearted guys are still the ones that put him in the pit. So he tests them a little bit. He says, I tell you what, we'll give you some bread, but I'm going to take the youngest Benjamin and I'm going to keep him here with me. That was his brother by Rachel. And you go back to your father. Now, Judah and all the brothers know that if jo Jacob lost Benjamin, he would just literally die. So look what Jacob does at that moment. Jacob comes forward, he negotiates with Joseph, and he says this, now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord say, slave in place of the boy, in place of Benjamin, who he hated, the story goes, and let the boy return with his brothers. Something, Jacob's a different person now. <laughs> He's a different person. He's saying, take me instead. Let me be the slave. I'll give up my whole life for Benjamin's sake. I'll give up my whole life for my father's sake. And at that point, Joseph says, do you hawker not me? Do you recognize me? It's Joseph. And they wept and they reconciled. Friends, there'll be no reconciliation in this world, in our homes, wherever. If there's not awakenings, each and every one of us, to identify, I, 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 hate, I hate the saying, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. That is, that is such a Pharisee's prayer. I pray it this way. I said, always love the sinner. 
Always love those who are broken and hate your own sin. Anything that separates me from God. Pray to Hakanah, all of us, right? Um, because, because when Judah did this, do you realize he became a vehicle for Jesus Christ to come into the world? And if we do that, we can become that same vehicle too. Because it's really interesting what happened after, after Judah's renewal, if you will. Watch this. Uh, Genesis goes on to say in uh, chapter uh, 49, he says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come. Judah didn't lose his place in, in the family. And he became one of Jesus' great, 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 great grandfathers. Because look at what Matthew says at the Christmas story that we'll be reading in a couple of months. Matthew says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. It's his birth certificate. And what's it say? Son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph. Judah. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. God's grace brought, set them straight, and the Messiah of the world came right from this lineage. These weren't di distant cousins. This was Jesus' own grandparents. And so that points us to the true and better son, to Perez, Perez the one who broke out so that we might come in. Jesus is the true breakthrough, right? It's, we, wanna, we know we're broken in sin, and just like the other child, we want to come out first, right? But Jesus goes, no, let me pull you back a little bit. I'll go for you. And that means any time in my life when I let the Judah in me, the dark Judah come out, and I look at people and say, take burn, I need to remember there was one taken for me. And he was willing to descend into the fires of hell. And that ought to bring me back and help me hunker nah, and help me recognize and come back home. There is one who has come forward for you and left a scarlet thread, the, the trace of love even in his own blood, to remind us that as we accept that and know that we're far more wicked than we ever knew, it took nothing short of the death of the son of the universe to save us, but we're far more loved than we ever dared dream. At the same time, we might be a vehicle for the grace and the peace and the love of Jesus Christ to come into the world too. Amen?